thanks for uh, tapping into the uh, Renew podcast today. We are really, I'm really excited to have as our guest, uh, Frank Viola. I think a lot of you know Frank Viola. He's written a gazillion books. My first introduction to you, Frank, was was Pagan Christianity. I mean, that's when I really got to know you. I love that book. That was just a, a nice little bomb you dropped on everybody. And uh, <laughs> caused no little bit of controversy, I've heard, uh, as you would expect. <laughs> but thanks for joining us, Frank. Yeah. Well, I'm privileged to be on, Greg. We've known each other for a long time, and it's just a delight to be able to have a conversation with you in public. Most of our conversations have been in private. And of course, we will not rehearse the things we talked about in those sessions, but <laughs> here we are. So we'll have to be very careful now what we say, because we have got the whole world listening. <laughs> I, I wish I had the whole world. Uh, it might be, you know, a couple thousand, but uh, <laughs> we're, 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 we're getting there. And, and uh, yeah, we never did follow through on our SmackDown that we were going to do. Remember, we were going to have a SmackDown on open theism? Yeah, well, you know, I um, I have to admit, Greg, just very recently here that I, I have backed out due to cowardice. I am right now, I'm right now holding in my hands the 1965 yearbook that has your senior photo in it. And there is a signature by Gregory A. Boyd, and it, it says, I was the head of the Open Theistic Beer Club. <laughs> so uh, I, I really would like you to speak to that, but I figure if you've been studying open theism since high school and I've got the yearbook to prove it, then why do I even want to engage in a match with you? Uh, okay. Uh, you're getting kind of close to home here. I like beer. I like beer. I still like beer. <laughs> Sometimes I drink too much. All right. Okay, very good. Yeah, okay, good and I, I, I didn't graduate in 1965. That would make me sound <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you caught. I'm glad you caught that. Uh, yes, uh, to your listeners, uh, Greg is not that old. Close to it, but not that old. <laughs> I'm young, young at heart. Okay, uh, I'd like to talk about your your most recent book, uh, Insurgents. Um, and I, I read that and I loved it. I thoroughly recommend it. Uh, I've tweeted on it. Uh, it. It's it's a congratulations. It's a very well done book. Well, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate that, especially coming from you, because I have great high respect for you, sir. You may be interested to know this, that that book was rejected by five publishers consecutively, one after the other. Really? Yeah, it was rejected on the basis, of, well, two reasons. One, the publishers had a real issue with some of the chapters. They felt like it was too controversial. You cannot put this in a book, I was told. And then the other part of it is they did not get the format. And as you know from reading it, I deliberately made the chapters extremely short. Most chapters are between one and two pages because yeah, yeah. I wanted the book to be digestible by anyone, including a high school student as well as a theologian or a scholar. And mm -hmm. so those are the two reasons why they did not want to touch it. Of course, now I think probably looking at how it's done, they, they probably regret it perhaps. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm glad that Baker, you know, put their neck out and, and went ahead and, and made the decision to do it. So, but thank yeah. you for the kind words. Well, well good for them. Uh, sometimes it's an honor to be rejected. You know, Letters from a Skeptic, which is still my best-selling book, it was rejected by 15 publishers before David C. Cook finally picked it up. <laughs> oh, so, well, bless their hearts. Bless yeah, their yeah. hearts. That's great. So, yeah, yeah you just, sometimes you just have to press through. So all you want to be authors out there, uh, you know, don't give up because you got a rejection. You got to get some thick skin and keep on pressing on. Amen. That's right. Well, I'll double talk on that. Frank. That tip is worth the money right there. We can call it quits while we're ahead. <laughs> okay. Hey, it was great talking to you. Uh, I'm going to sell this yearbook uh, to Goodwill and see if I can get top dollar for your signature. Well, you, you, you could uh, probably get some money for that on eBay. There's some detractors of mine who would love to know that I drank too much. <laughs> They, they would follow that up. Okay, so so you, uh, insurgents is, is basically about the kingdom of God. In fact, that's a, a thing you're seeing published a lot on these days. Seems like uh, everybody and their grandmother is publishing a book on the kingdom of God. Um, so, what was it that, that that led you, inspired you, motivated you to to uh, write yet another book on the kingdom of God? I appreciate the question because it's something that I'm very burdened with, particularly the story behind it. About 10 years ago, I, I had a very strong sense to to look at what Scripture had to say about the kingdom in its totality. And so I began to look at it 
from Genesis to Revelation, not through a systematic theological lens, but through a narrative lens. Okay. And that led me to, to see this phrase jump out at me in living color. That phrase was the gospel of the kingdom which we find in the Gospels, and we also see it repeated in the book of Acts. And Greg, I'll just say that what I discovered, particularly with that phrase, the Gospel of the Kingdom, astounded me, it deeply challenged me, it, it riveted me, and it altered the way that I looked at the Lord, the Scripture, and the Gospel itself. And I began to compare what I was seeing to what I see and have seen over the last decade on social media. My observation is that most Christians, okay, I could be wrong, maybe it's many, but in my, in my world, most Christians merrily repeat the talking points of either the progressive left or the conservative right. Yep. And Jesus Christ and his kingdom are left out in the cold. And uh, out of the social media feed, the heart speaks that's what I believe. <laughs> you know, it's not what you say, it's what you're writing on your Twitter feed and your Facebook that really nails what you believe and what you're passionate about. And when I stepped back from that, I discovered that it, it dawned on me that the earth-shaking, jarring, titanic gospel of the kingdom that shook the world in the first century had been largely lost to us. And so in the summer of 2017, uh, I spoke in a conference and I delivered eight messages unveiling the best I could the gospel of the kingdom. And the weekend was just electric. People gave confessions that their lives had been transformed. There were spontaneous baptisms in response to some of the messages, something that took us all by surprise. Wow. And every person who was baptized in water made a public confession in front of everybody. And what they were saying was that they had made a decision to break all ties with the world system mm -hmm. and to give their full and complete allegiance to Jesus Christ and the alternative civilization that the New Testament calls the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. And I believe, at least in my world, in my observation, that that's where the insurgence began, at least from my perspective and, and where, I, where I'm concerned, you know, the people that I relate to. And so I felt like I needed to put this in a book. You may be like this yourself, but I write the book that I want to read, but I can't find. Mm. And so while there's so many books on the kingdom of God, there are very few that unveil the gospel of the kingdom in a way that's powerful but also in a way that's very easy to read and understand. And that takes a comprehensive look at it from Genesis to Revelation and also gives very practical handles or practical exercises on how to actually implement it into your life. Okay. And so that was the vision of the book that I myself wanted to read. I looked, I couldn't find it. And so this is my own contribution, however weak and, and frail it is, to get across this incredible gospel, and, and also, Greg, to do it in a way that wasn't legalistic, right, that right. didn't put people under a pile of guilt. Because anytime mm -hmm. Christians talk about the kingdom or aspects of the kingdom, so often it's couched in condemnation, and you're not doing enough, and, you know, oh gosh, we're all convicted, yeah, yeah, and yeah. let's go home and lick our guilt wounds, and <laughs> you know what I mean? No, and no. so I, I was really trying to thread this needle you know, this narrow edge to be able to proclaim it uncompromisingly, right, with raw right. challenge as I see it, as it came to me, as I see it in the New Testament, but also to do it without a shred of legalism. And yeah, that, I, was, I, I like that, that was the impossible goal. There's a real uh, uh, thrust there about how we have to be transformed by a compelling vision, and the, and the beauty transforms us. It's not a ought to do, got to do, should do. It, it's rather about being transformed. And I love the way that you Constantly, and this, this is true of your previous books too, but, and you and I shared this conviction about not letting the gospel get co-opted by some other agenda, either on the right or the left. So can, can you yeah. flesh out a little bit about uh, your concept of the gospel of the kingdom, how it contrasts with uh, maybe some of the other versions of the gospel that are out there? Yeah, that's one of the things I tried to, I tried to get across in the book. You know, when you when you compare the gospel of the kingdom to what we normally hear in Christian circles, from whatever tribe you come from, 
you kind of see how it stands out and how distinct it is. So just for example, a quick riff. The prevailing gospel that's preached today, in my experience, is the gospel of legalism. And that basically says, God's holy, you're not, try harder. Mm-hmm. And what it does is it, it produces a judgmentalism and a, and a condemning spirit among the Christians who imbibe this gospel. Because usually what's happening is they're laboring under guilt. They're trying so hard to make God happy. They're failing. They're living under a hangover of guilt. But then they think to themselves deep down inside internally, well, it doesn't work for me, but it should work for everybody else. So then they throw a pile of guilt on every other Christian that doesn't measure up. So that's the one gospel that I think is dominating. The other gospel, which is a reaction to the first one, is the gospel of libertinism. And that's the gospel that says you're under grace. God understands that you're a mere miserable mortal so it doesn't really matter what you do in your private life Hmm. and that's kind of the other extreme right so you have the way i put it is the libertine the person who's embraced that gospel acts as though there is no god and the legalist acts as though he or she is god to everybody else and so you have these two these two dichotomies, these two false gospels, as it were. And, you know, Greg, you know this, you're a New Testament scholar, but Paul battled with both oh, yeah. in the first century. And, you know, I mean, there's... Me abound. Absolutely. You got, you got the gospel of libertinism coming out of the ears of the Corinthians, and he takes dead aim at that in his letter to them. And then you have the gospel of legalism, which is being addressed in Galatians. And so these have been around for a long time. And then the other alternatives are, I I see on the conservative right, and again, this is a trend and this is the tendency. It doesn't mean that everybody that's on the conservative right would fit this, but there is a tendency to worship at the altar of nationalism. Yeah, amen, preach it. But on the other side are our progressive left brothers and sisters. The tendency there is to worship on the altar of globalism. Hmm. And you also have, if you look at these two wings of the church, so to speak, you have an idol that is made out of capitalism, and that's very, very much in the drinking water of many Christians on the conservative right. But then you also have an idol made out of socialism on the progressive left. Hmm. And so both, in my view, and I, I try to bring this out clearly in the book, in my view and in my conviction and my passion is that either one of those are the conservative right and the progressive left. Both of them have very few points of contact with the gospel of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And Jesus Christ, when he entered into this planet, he was living in the midst of the progressive left and the conservative right of his day. Right. The Sadducees were the equivalent of the progressive left. Right. And the Pharisees were the equivalent of the conservative right. And he gave them both apoplexy mm-hmm. because his message transcended and collided with both. Mm-hmm. And he also subverted allegiance to Rome and its emperor, as you know, mm-hmm. and as you've pointed out. So I believe we're living in a day where Christians have become consumed. They've spent their time and energy and focus on merrily repeating the talking points of either the left or the right, and then they conflate that with the kingdom. Mm-hmm. And what I'm suggesting in this book, as I try to bring it out point by point, is that the gospel of the kingdom is something that is completely outside both Both the progressive left, as we know it today, and both the conservative right are part of this thing called the world system, which I believe many of us are not really clear on. And a lot of the book is talking about breaking the ties with and breaking the loyalty oath with this thing called the world system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then entering into the allegiance to Jesus Christ and his alternative civilization, which is the kingdom of God. It's like, it seems to me that, that, and I think we've been on a similar journey with this, but it's the, the the kingdom that Jesus inaugurates with his death and resurrection is is so unusual. It's so it, it's it's too beautiful for our categories, and it's so unique that that there's always a tendency, and this is true throughout history, but certainly after the fourth and fifth centuries, that to to try to tame it and to put it into categories we're familiar with, and the categories we're familiar with, 
since everybody is either more right brain or left brain uh, inclined and, and more conservative or more liberal wired. I mean, that's kind of people's hard wiring. So we, we, we put it in those categories and, and thereby it gets co-opted into, you know, it basically whatever you think is good gets identified with the kingdom of God. <laughs> and so it's, it's, a, it's, an, it's a content let content less bucket. And, and you just put everything that you, you know, favor in there and call that the kingdom of God. Whereas, uh, I think what, what what insurgents does so well is it shows the utter uniqueness of this of this thing, and uh, you can't you can't co-opt it, uh, and or you can't translate it into your political or cultural or national or globalistic categories. Uh, it, it stands alone. So, uh, what are some like uh, of all the the books being published now in the Kingdom of God? What are some errors that you see people making? Well, again, this is my view, and, and readers will have to look at the book and assess for themselves, because I do pack it very tightly with Scripture, and again, not just from a proof-texting viewpoint or approach, which I don't approve of, but looking at it in the narrative of both Old and New Testament together, because a story emerges that's quite powerful. And by the way, what you just said... I wish you had said that to me before I finished the book, because I would have loved to have quoted you. <laughs> it was brilliant. <laughs> oh, thanks. Um, I'm yeah, so what, what, what you what you outline, outline in your book, you know. So uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, sounds you great. You just turn into oh. a mutual pat, pat each other on the back, kind of a, a session. No, you're great. No, you're great. No, you're great. <laughs> oh, shut up! I'll give you more. <laughs> I used to, I used to, let me give you a little story. I used to teach high school uh, years ago uh, in, in a land far, far away. And um, there was this big, big guy who was one of my students. He was a senior. He was a wrestler. And he would come into class every day. And we had this little thing going whenever he walked into class. His name was Butch. And I would look at Butch and I would point to him and I would say, you, you. And then he, Butch would turn to me and he would say, no, no, not me, you. And then I would turn back and I'd say, no, 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 not me, it's you. And this was, you know, we were commending each other. And then finally, Butch would look at me and would say, okay, me. <laughs> anyway. Uh, that's a little goofy uh, yeah, antidote. You, guys, that I, that you see what school. you do to me? You bring me back to high school. What's going on with that? Uh, and, and you used to wrestle, right? I only arm wrestled. I didn't actually do the real thing. Oh, I, I, <laughs> I was just an arm wrestler. Oh, I hear, I hear I thought you were this big stud that had big muscles and were was a pro wrestler or something. Well, No, that's it's not me. Those were photos of somebody else who favored me. But anyway, <laughs> they, um, they yeah, so here are some points that I believe are misconceptions about the kingdom. And by the way, I agree with you in that we're Westerners, we're sons of Aristotle. So often when I'm interviewed about the subject, people will say, well, tell us what the gospel of the kingdom is exactly. Give us a definition or give us a definition of the kingdom of God. Yeah. And my response to that is once you define something like the kingdom of God, you have just drained it from its power and mm. eliminated its glory. Because you cannot, you, it's impossible to give a Western, concise, neat and tidy definition of the kingdom of God without actually destroying the reality. And there's another danger, too, and that is that people, uh, in my experience, when they define something or they mm -hmm. memorize a definition, in their head, their circuitry equates that to having the reality of it. Uh, okay. You see what I mean? So yeah, yeah, uh, I never, I never want to define it. Jesus never defines it. Paul never defines it. Paul says what it's not. He'll say the kingdom of God is not dot, dot, dot. And he'll add a few things. And Jesus would always, would always say things like the kingdom of God is like. Right, right, right. The kingdom of God is likened to. So he would illustrate it. But it is too vast and glorious to be put in a definition. Well, what's wrong with the definition like the reign of God? You know what? The reign of God does nothing for me, Greg. It, it just absolutely, it doesn't excite me. I, it does, it, there's no life in it. You know, and I don't really think that that captures the glory and the power and the majesty and the beauty of the kingdom. And that's why, that's why I spent so much time kind of illustrating it and illustrating and il illustrating it so that when people uh, finish the book, the circuitry is blown, that this is a vision that is so incredible. 
Mm -hmm. that it transcends that. So I just feel like the reign of God is too weak and too limited, and that's that's my own view uh, oh. on that. But let me let me get into some misconceptions here from my viewpoint, right. right or wrong. One of them, number one, I think I think probably all, all your listeners and readers, for that matter, will probably nod their heads with this one. But the kingdom of God is the equivalent of going to heaven. That's misconception number one. Yeah. And we have a large portion, a large segment of the body of Christ who pushes it off into the future. I think that the correct understanding of how the New Testament envisions the kingdom is that it is, in fact, in its reality, it is, in fact, a future event. But that future has been brought into the present. Right, right. With the ascension of Jesus Christ. So, in effect, those who enter the kingdom are living in the presence of the future. And yeah. when we are living in that alternative civilization called the kingdom, as we're walking together, and I believe it's a corporate thing, not just an individual thing, but heavily corporate, yes. we are spreading the invisible geography of the kingdom of God on the planet. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the, one of the themes that I, I try to trace. Secondly, the kingdom of God, here's another misconception from my view, the kingdom of God is associated with the Christian effort to take dominion in the world by influencing lawmakers to pass laws that represent Christian values. And that is championed by many on the conservative right, but also on the progressive left. You're right about that. that. Amen. And they both, I mean, the tendency for both camps is to sit at the seat of Caesar and try to implement the kingdom of God on earth through political and social activism. And I believe very strongly that the political system, and I make a case for this in the book, the political system as we know it, and I don't care where you're from, if you're on this planet, in this fallen world, the political system is part of the world system. Mm. And so we're trying to achieve something that Jesus Christ is at odds with. We're trying to use that as a mechanism to try to bring out God's kingdom. And it just, it just does not work. And, and what's interesting, too, is that both the conservative right and the progressive left, in my view, Greg, they are both attempting to accomplish the same thing and use, and use the same mechanism, but they cut the moral line in a different place. In mm. other words, uh, to use the imagery of the tree of, the, uh, of knowledge of good and evil in Genesis, they're eating from the same tree. They're just eating off of different parts of it. Sure, yeah. And again, I'm talking broadly here. I'm not speaking uh, for everyone. Okay, so here's another one. Here's a third one. This one's close to me close to home uh, because I come out of this movement, but the kingdom of God is the equivalent of signs, wonders, and miracles in the earth. My tribe is the Pentecostals and Charismatics. That's where I grew up. That's my camp. That's my world. Uh, of course, I'm not really associated with it anymore. And I will say a kind word about the Pentecostals and the Charismatics. We are the blondes of the Christian faith. We have more fun. <laughs> no, no, I, I come from the Pentecostal background too. And, and, the church services are not boring. They may get a little crazy, but they're not uh, there you go. Amen. So I'm not a cessationist, and neither are you. But what I would say to this crowd, which is making a big comeback right now in certain movements, is that Jesus Christ certainly did signs and wonders, and that is part of the kingdom. Don't mm -hmm. get me wrong now. But the main impulse and emphasis has nothing to do with signs and wonders. And if you just look, I'll give you one small example. There are many others. But if you just look at the so-called Sermon on the Mount, and we can thank Augustine for calling it that. But it, if we look at his message in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, which is really a charter for the kingdom, he right. never mentions signs and wonders except at the very end. Mm. And what does he say about it? it it'll chill your blood. In that day, many will say, we did signs and wonders and cast out demons and prophesy in your name. And then he turns around and says, I never knew you. So, you know, my point is you cannot equate the kingdom with signs, wonders, and miracles. Uh, another one is, oh boy, this is one that's going to get me in hot water, my Here's friend. Enough. <laughs> Audience, are you sitting down? Audience, uh, are you sitting down? You better sit down for this. <laughs> yeah, sitting down Thanks with guns loaded. Your mind. <laughs> No, it's not going to blow our minds. It might get me uh, in trouble. But you know what? I've been through a lot of this. You know, Greg, I used to be an angel, but the backbiters chewed my wings off. 
<laughs> anyway, <laughs> here's another misconception. The kingdom of God is the equivalent of social justice and social activism. Now, oh boy, I, I heard a, a few of those podcast channels just turn off right now. Uh, <laughs> well, I think that, uh, roll it out. What do you mean by that? You know what? All I want to do here in this front is to read a testimonial from a, a friend of mine. He's a pastor in the inner city of Philadelphia. And he read the book, and he wrote this, and he sent it to me. And I think it encapsulates, you know, what I want to say about that point. But I do talk about it in the book, and I do go through Scripture and, and give examples of what I mean. But here's what he said. I have struggled with the divide in the body of Christ when it comes to race, economics, etc., there have been times when I have been discouraged and disappointed with other Christians. I carried the flag of social justice. I carried the flag of conservatism, evangelical politics. I carried the charismatic flag. I carried the flag of isolationism. And he also says, I carried the flag of Black Lives Matter. I was a part of that organization. I carried every flag but Jesus Christ. I have been to seminary, I finished my doctorate work, all I can say, and he's referring to the book, radically changed my life, my vision, my perspective on Christianity. Greg, God's people can be enamored with a cause, they can be enamored with trying to make the world a better place, and leave the Lord Jesus Christ out in the rain. And you cannot separate the kingdom of God from the king himself. I know that you agree with me on this, but I am convinced that Jesus of Nazareth is alive, not in a metaphorical or a symbolic way, but he's just as alive as you are and just as alive as I am, and he demands our absolute allegiance. Mm -hmm. That's not the same as an allegiance to a cause, no matter how noble or good, but a radical allegiance to to himself. But now, Frank, Frank, and, would, would you agree with this? That I mean, I totally agree with you on that. That the kingdom is always it. it everything that's done in the kingdom has to flow out of uh, out of uh, the relationship with Christ, and uh, I, I think it has to be compelled by the love of Christ. That's what Paul says. Everything he does, he does because he's compelled. But now, uh, given that relationship, um, uh, you're not suggesting that churches shouldn't be doing anything about the poor or the homeless or uh you know people who suffer um you know racism or things of that sort are you not at all but what i am saying is that the chief calling of the ecclesia is best seen in what the nation of israel was to god that god set up this nation of israel to be a kingdom of priests that would exhibit what life was like when God was king, when God was Lord, when God right, was right. sovereign and in charge. And so they, in effect, if I can use this wording, they weren't trying to make the world a better place. They were the better place in a dark yes. world. And that better place spilled over as an organic consequence into the surrounding world. Now, when Jesus comes on the scene, he's coming not to change the world system. In fact, he took dead right. aim at it. He blasted it with both barrels. He came to set up an alternative civilization that would be a light and that would be salt and that would be something for God Almighty right. to reveal himself through. And so the kingdom community, in my view, doesn't exist to try to change the world system or to try to make the world a better place. That's not the chief agenda. Right. The chief agenda is to be the better place in a dark world, and as a consequence, that is going to flow out into the surrounding world. So consequently, here's how I look at it. If you uh, were exported, if you and I were exported into, oh, the city of Thessalonica in 52 AD, and we wanted to see where is the kingdom of God? Well, the kingdom of God, I would point to a house, <laughs> Uh, meeting over here where Jason is and some other brothers and sisters, there are probably 40 or 50 of them, meeting in a living room. Of course, this is the beginning of the church plant there, the Ecclesia plant there. And what I would see is a group of people who are made up of Jew and Gentile 
which have a history of millennia of hating one another. Mm -hmm. Beyond any racism we have ever seen in our day, Greg, you know this, you're a historian, the mm -hmm. racism, the, the deep enmity, the hatred between the Jew and the Gentile was unparalleled. Nothing in history has ever trumped it. No pun intended. But the point is, is that the, 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 here, here you have Jew and Gentile, you have women and men, and they are rich loving and each other. They seek a yeah, rich and poor, thank you, slave and, and master, and they are walking into the marketplace arm in arm, loving each other, caring for one another. They have joy, which was unheard of in the first century. Everybody was miserable. They're giving each other's jobs. They call each other by the first name, which basically obliterates their social status. They see each other as being on the same social platform. And they love each other, they marry each other, and they bury each other. And that was the kingdom of God in the city of Thessalonica. And as a result, and you know this from the letter, he says, your faith is spreading everywhere. It spilled over into the community. And that's why I believe a kingdom community that has given its full allegiance to Jesus Christ, that's living as a face-to-face -face community, is the greatest evangelist on the planet. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because that community is so magnetic. It is so unusual. It's so different. And the world gets to see what a community of people look like where there is no racism, where there is no injustice, where there is forgiveness and there is love and all the things the world is clamoring for. They see it in that alternative sure. civilization. So that's I, I, really, this is the heart of the insurgents. Okay. I, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, I, I think that we're to put on display the already in the midst of the not yet world, you know, put on display the character of God and, and uh, uh, how, you know what it looks like when 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 God is ruling over uh, a people. My, my, the other the concern I have is that uh, th there's so many churches that have bought into this idea that um, uh, our job is to just you know save souls and we leave to government uh, all issues of social justice and social activism and and things of that sort. I mean they won over people's hearts by by their courageous service and sometimes giving their life for others. And, and see, that, that's what I mean by, like, that is a form of social activism, but it's, it's done with a totally different motivation. They're, this is just who we are. You know, they're not trying to, you know, tweak the world system or you know, give the new and improved version of the kingdoms of the world. They're just... Yeah, exactly, just exactly. Love. And I totally agree with you. And I actually talk about this dynamic in the first century church, not just the later years, which you're referring to, but in the, in the actual first century church, their view of possessions was very different than that of most Americans. And oh, this yeah. is one of the biggest challenges of the gospel of the kingdom, especially for those of us who live in the West. Yeah. I mean, quite frankly, we have a love affair with money and possessions. It's in the warp and woof of the Christian church. My point being is that I totally agree with you, but I think it's more than just the motivation. That was a community of people. I'm talking about the first century kingdom communities. Notice I didn't use the word church because it conjures up all sorts of things that are so far from the first century that it's not even funny. So I'd like to liquidate that right now. But the kingdom community in the first century, we're talking about a face-to-face -face community of people who had given their total allegiance to Jesus Christ and were absolutely out of their heads in love with him. And that produced a love for one another. And then that outflowed into what you're talking about, an organic, unscripted not out of duty or condemnation or law, a love for those around, particularly the hurting and the poor and the oppressed and so forth, which Jesus talks about in Luke 4. But the, the issue that I think we often miss is that on the one hand, yes, you do have churches that are so insular and it's all about getting people to heaven and there's no concern for anybody who is suffering. You have that going on, but then you also have people who are part of these organizations called churches who have no face-to-face -face community. They have no love for one another. They don't even know one another. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to do these, these kinds of good efforts and noble deeds as individuals. Mm -hmm. And what, I, what I'm suggesting in the book is that there is a compelling vision that is so powerful. And I've been part of it my, in my life throughout the years, here and there over the years. And it's just, it's a completely 
different dynamic. Mm-hmm. And so you have both. You have the community of believers who are taking care of each other, who are loving one another, who, who are, as I said before, marrying each other and burying each other, and they see one another as brother and sister. And these are Jews and Gentiles, which is just mind-blowing. And yet, that's spilling over into the surrounding neighborhoods yeah, yeah. the people they're with. And I think we missed the first point, is what I'm saying, yeah. is that there, to have this face-to-face community is something lacking. And so when people hear the gospel of the kingdom, not only does it challenge them individually, but now they have a corporate vision of what life together could be like, right, to right. quote Bonhoeffer's book. Right, right. Life together. Yeah, um, I, I, those are all related. I think it's our love of money and a love of possessions that keeps us largely isolated from one another. Who's got time to, uh, you know, really have significant, uh, you know, fellowship uh, and life spent with others when you're chasing after a bigger house, bigger car, better this, better that, and all Bingo. that. I, you know, one, one of the things that I uh, in, really appreciate about Insurgents, uh, and as well as this comes out in, in uh, some of your other works, but uh, you're, you, you take spiritual warfare seriously, uh, and most don't. <laughs> so t- talk to me a little bit about the principles and powers. In fact, you had a, a section uh, where you were talking about Luke 10 and Acts 2. And if you, can you flesh that out about the, 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 the whole cosmic story and how the principles and powers fit into that? Or Luke 10 and Acts 2, you can. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And I'll give you a quick riff. And I do want to say to your listeners that Greg Boyd, is probably the top voice in the Christian world right now who really understands spiritual warfare and the power and reality of principalities and powers over nations. Would you like to riff on that some more? Expound. (laughs) Don't worry. I'm expecting a check for this too as well, brother. So, (laughs) uh, and you have my address. So, uh, but no, seriously, you've done great work on this and it's just unfortunate to me that we're living in a time where so many Christians, uh, not all obviously, and not probably not even most, but there's a segment of Christians who have kind of imbibed the empiricist mindset that if you can't see it, taste it, touch it, then it's not real. And right. so consequently, Satan is just a metaphor and evil spirits are a metaphor. You really cannot square that with a sober, careful reading of the New Testament and spiritual intelligence and revelation. But anyway, yeah, yeah, uh, so you've I, done I brilliant work on this. Well, you've thanks. done brilliant you know, work part on this. I think uh, there's the empiricist part of it, although the people continue to believe in God and, and uh, he, he's invisible. I, I never understood why it's so hard to believe if you believe in an all good uh, spirit agent, why is it so hard to believe in an evil one? I, I, I never quite got the logic of that. But the other thing is that so many Christians have a, um, a, 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 a definition of God's sovereignty as control that, that there can be no real warfare. If God's doing it all, then, then yeah, you'll talk maybe about warfare because the Bible does, but it can't really mean anything because there's not anything at stake. There's not really any opposition if God's will is already doing everything. So it gets left out for a lot of reasons, and I, I appreciate the fact that uh, you 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 emphasize that human beings have got free will, and um, God's not a microcontroller, and, and and things like that, and that, that that's what gives you space to talk about principles and powers in a robust uh, sense. Amen to that. And and whatever whatever one's view of God's sovereignty is, it doesn't change the fact that the New Testament, Jesus, the apostles, exhort us to engage in spiritual warfare and many other things and that all fits within the sovereignty of god however you view it you can't you know excavate eliminate those passages from the new testament under the banner of god's sovereignty and i'm glad we're joined at the hip there too but let me just give a quick riff on this and i go into more detail in the book some of this may sound very strange to some of your listeners just depending on what what they've read of the old testament but in short sometime after the flood God saw the increasing wickedness of the earth, and at Babel, this is Genesis 10 and 11, you have God acting to take down that tower, and you have the table of nations, which now are the the people of the earth have been dispersed into nation states. This is the first time you see the word kingdom in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Okay, now what's fascinating about this is that what God ended up doing, and this is not clear in Genesis 10 and 11, you have to map it out in the Psalms and in Deuteronomy, and you also have great attestation of this 
in Second Temple Judaic literature. But when you put all the pieces together, it makes perfect sense. God basically disinherited the nations of the earth. He was done with them. And he said, I'm going to set up over the nations celestial beings which are under me, and they are going to oversee the nations. But I myself am finished with them, and I'm going to create a new nation that will be my inheritance. Hmm. And I will be for them, and they will be for me. But as far as the other nations are concerned, there's seven mentioned in the Table of Nations in Genesis 10. They are under the oversight of these celestial beings, okay? In Deuteronomy, where it says he, he divided up the nations according to the number of the sons of God? Yeah, and that's, that's also in Psalm. You have Psalm 82. You have the Deuteronomy passage. Yeah, and all this is in the book. People can look up the references. What's so fascinating is that after Genesis 11, what does God do? He calls Abraham. And now he has his new nation. Well, what ends up happening is that these celestial beings who are under God, they're aligned with God, they're over the nations, they end up going the way of Lucifer, and they fall, and they rebel against God. They become corrupt and power-hungry. God actually brings judgment on them, a word of judgment in the Psalms. And what ends up happening is now the nations are worshiping these celestial beings, and they become the gods of the Gentile. They become the pagan gods, as it were. Right, but right. they used to be. They used to be with Jehovah Yahweh. They used to be with the Lord of Hosts. But now they have rebelled. So when you come to the New Testament, you find Jesus breaking into the scene, and he is announcing that the kingdom of the heavens has now come to earth. God is ready to come back and become king, and he is now going to also fulfill a prophecy in Isaiah where God said, I'm going to re-inherit the nations. Hmm. There's going to come a time where I'm going to bring them all back to myself. And what's so fascinating is that Jesus reconstitutes the new Israel via the 12 apostles, and then in Luke 10, he sends out 70 now, why does he send out 70? Huh. Because there's 70 nations that have been distributed over the earth who had been disinherited by Yahweh. And Jesus sends out his emissaries and he says, preach the gospel of the kingdom. The kingdom of God has come. They are to now come back to me and to my father. I'm paraphrasing here. And so they go into those 70 nations and there's warfare there's spiritual warfare there's electricity in the heavens and Jesus even said I saw Satan fall right. well, what's so fascinating is that the fulfillment of that word given in Isaiah that he's re-inheriting the nations we also find it happening in Acts chapter 2 when Luke starts to talk about the day of Pentecost, he lists the nations that are present. And they map perfectly to the nations in Genesis 10. They just have different names. Mm -hmm. Okay? And then when you look carefully at the Greek in Acts chapter 2 and you compare it with the Septuagint, which is the Greek Old Testament of Genesis 10 and 11, he uses lots of the same language. And the point there is that he is overturning Babel. Mm -hmm. Babel is being reversed. Yep. And now the kingdom of God has come to earth. God is re-inheriting the nations. And so now basically he has come to finish what he started and to reconcile all things to himself. And when Paul uses the term principalities and powers, and you, you point this out as well in some of your work, that term refers to geographic territorial authority. Mm -hmm. So these principalities and powers, which became the gods of the pagans, 
uh, are in effect over certain regions. And we see this in Daniel, the book of Daniel, the prince of Persia, the prince of Greece. There are principalities and powers which are fallen celestial beings that are over the nations. And the gospel of the kingdom, through God's people, those who have embraced that gospel, who are living that gospel, who have given their allegiance to Jesus Christ, the king of that gospel, one of the things we're doing on this planet is we are continuing the work of re-inheriting the nations to bring them under the kingship of Jesus Christ. And there's a whole lot more to it, but that's kind of a quick introduction. Uh, that's good. And certainly, spiritual warfare is a real thing. Yeah, I, 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 I love the way you uh, connect the dots with uh, you know, Babel and then the book of Acts and then the ministry of Jesus. I had never considered the 70 sent out to be sort of a symbolic expression of the 70 nations. Uh, it, I had never made that connection. That's an interesting thing in there. He basically put his celestial guard, it's actually called the Divine Council in many passages right. in the Old Testament, and a number of scholars have written about it over the years, but he put them over them, and so he was, in, f in effect, still ruling over them, but he was doing it through these intermediaries. Right, right. And, um, I mean, the way I was couching it was just for effect to kind of give the stark reality that God had left them in one sense, but now is coming back to them through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and bringing them back into the fold. It, it didn't mean he didn't care about the people of the earth. It's just that his agenda had totally changed, and he was working with his inheritance via Abraham yeah. and Israel. Okay, good, good, good. I, I've got to start to wrap this up, but uh, uh, so let me ask you this final thing. Um, you know, I, I, what I found is, and I, I, I expect that you'll totally agree with this, but the, the, you, you don't make much money publishing books like we publish, but the, but the real paycheck is when you uh, see the difference it's making in people's lives. You know, the, the, the Cross Vision and Chris Fiction of the Warrior Guide, which I published last year, it's just been so breathtakingly rewarding when, when you, you get testimonies of people whose paradigms totally shifted and stuff. So tell me a, a little bit about, uh, talk to us about the impact that, that you, or at least the feedback that you've gotten about insurgents. Well, you're right about what you said regarding authors and uh, those of you boys and girls listening in Radio Land and podcast world uh, want to be an author uh, and don't do it for the money because you'll be sorely disappointed. Probably. Uh, <laughs> what Greg said is right. You have to be able to do it, or you, you want to, if you're going to put a book out into the world, it should be because you're passionate about the message, and that's it. Yeah. And you leave the results with the Lord. But the response to the book so far came out a few months ago. I think we have over 100 reviews on Amazon, which is surprising, because we didn't do a, a blogger campaign just people who have been impacted have written in but I have received more letters of testimonials of altered lives from this book than I have any other which is incredibly humbling because it did that to me the message did that to me it shook me to my foundations and I'm, I'm still on a daily basis you know exploring the different areas that the Lord is bringing me into as it relates to the kingdom and you'll find that because the message is so powerful and, and as I put it in the book it's the most powerful message in the New Testament I'm speaking of the gospel of the kingdom mm -hmm. but I have to pause at certain places and just pray for the Lord's mercy it is that challenging and it is that powerful but the testimonials have been coming in regularly, and many of them are from pastors. And I'm hearing stuff like this, which is mind-boggling. And some of these guys I know, these are people who are veterans in ministry. They're very seasoned. They're very gifted. And they're very spiritual experienced. But they're saying things like, I have decided to be rebaptized, which is just mind-blowing to me, because they now understand what baptism means for the first time in their life, according to their yeah. confession. Many pastors are writing and saying they have, they're having personal revivals in their own life. It's shaking them up but like they've never experienced. And I, I'm so grateful, but I'm also, on the other hand, you know, there's a gravity there too. And as I continue, I'm meeting with leaders on a regular basis to talk about the insurgents and talk about how to spread it. There's just a great weight. There's joy on the one, one hand to see what the Lord has done despite 
my inabilities and my weaknesses as a writer and speaker, but also how God is bringing something about, that there is an insurgence happening with respect to the gospel of the kingdom and its restoration and fullness. And so there's a heavy gravity that goes along with that. That's Pleased great. And, yeah. and, that, and, and why do you call it insurgents? Well, Jesus was called an insurgent. He was, in effect, an enemy of the state. And an insurgent is, well, as you've dubbed it in some of your work, a revolution against the present order. Mm. And uh, not just the religious order, but also the political order and the social order yeah. and all of it. Like you said, the kingdom of God is so unique. It's unlike anything else that's ever arrived on this planet. Yeah, and yeah. let me just end with this point, and I'm, I'm speaking from first. Peter chapter 2, and your listeners can read it, but, you know, for those who have joined the insurgents, Greg, and have embraced the gospel of the kingdom, the only nationalism we know is allegiance to what Peter calls the holy nation, yeah. which is a colony of heaven on this planet. Yeah. That's the only flag we bow down to, and the only globalism we know is allegiance to the global lordship and kingship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we plant our flag there, brother, we can see God do some amazing things in history. I, I, I agree. I agree. Uh, yeah, you know, one of the things that's been so exciting for me, it's been so exciting for the last uh, 15 years, I guess, is just discovering how all around the globe there are people that are getting, to one degree or another, this vision of the kingdom, and, and, and many times it's on their own. Uh, and they, they just realize that they you know, serve a Jesus-looking God, and they're called to be, look like Jesus, and they're called to change the world in a Jesus kind of way. And, and um, they're, they're experimenting with new ways of doing Christian community. I've just, so many breathtakingly beautiful things out there. And so it's, it's like as Christendom is crumbling, um, you know, out of, the, out of the rubble is rising up this new thing that you're calling insurgents. And uh, it's not yet an identifiable movement. Uh, it's not like it's surrounded by any one person or anything. No one's organizing it. But That's right. there's these loose-knit pockets of folks all over the place. And it's yes. just exciting to see. what I, I think uh, we're at the cusp of a reformation that will make the reformation of the 16th century look, look like a little hiccup. Well, brother, I'm, uh, I'm honored and privileged to call you a friend and uh, a fellow laborer in the insurgence of God. I'll Thank end you. with this one point that, that is, and this kind of sums up, I guess, the main question of the book, but the kind of convert produced is the result of the kind of gospel preached. And the reason why we are have seen for so many years such a lack in the Lord's people as it concerns quote-unquote Christians is because of the gospel that's been presented. And so I hope this contribution and the work you're doing will recover that lost, incredible, titanic gospel of the kingdom that this earth needs again. Mm -hmm. It's coming, praise God. Okay, keep up your good work, Frank. Oh, I, I, I should just say, uh, if people want to uh, get this book, they can get it on Amazon, and they want to find out about, more about you, they can go to, what, frankviola.org? That's right, yeah, frankviola.org, and we also have a website just for the book, and there are free samples and other interviews called insurgents.org, insurgents.org. Wonderful. Well, thanks a lot, Frank, for coming on. It's good talking with you. I'm sure we'll do it again. Thanks, brother. Take care, man. Have a great day.